We have to learn our lessons because of the notion of karma. Everything that we think, everything that we do comes back to us. The results come back to us so that we can experience how it went and what happened when we had those thoughts and performed those actions. And interestingly enough, there is a, a theologian philosopher uh, from long, long ago named Oregon. He was, the, his philosophy was the philosophy of the early Christian church, uh, the early Christian uh, groups, if you will. And he taught reincarnation and he taught the law of cause and effect. So those notions are gradually filtering back into some Christian discussions. These are the generation who had come in not, um, not being able to resonate with the old formulas of Christianity. And here they have this experience that apparently is, is just incredible. And if you think of the youngsters nowadays, I know many, many of them, they're not interested in buying a house. They're not interested in even having a car. They want to experience something. And so I think it's incredibly um, appropriate that this kind of experience uh, is being had by so many of that generation. It's quite fitting. Welcome everyone to another episode of Planetary Makeover. And today we're having a guest on that we've had before, Betsy Whitfield. And she's gonna to talk to us about bridging Christianity and the ageless wisdom teaching that you hear us talk so much about on this show. And Betsy herself is a veteran of the study of the ageless wisdom teaching, a philosophy major, a mother, a gardener, a wife, and so much more. And on this subject, she knows a lot more than I do. So I'm going to get out of the way and let her speak. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And we're glad you're back. And today we're talking about the current goings on in the Christian church. And could you tell us a little bit more about your take on the changes that are happening in Christian churches across the globe? Surely, yes. The, uh, the background for the radical changes that are occurring in the Christian churches, at least in America, which is what I know, uh, the backdrop for all of this are the changes that the, the whole planet is going through because we are in a new age of Aquarius and there are energies that are stimulating people. Uh, and those people are becoming more aware of themselves and more aware of the need for a new way of relating to people. And as we know, the history of religion really is based on uh, knowing how to relate properly person to person and all the other relationships uh, person to state, to town, to to even country. And that relationship, which should be based on a love, a, a identification with the other, uh, has been historically the essence of spiritual slash religious teachings from the very beginning. So what's happening now is that as chaotic as it seems, we're being drawn through a transformation so deep, so wide, that it's difficult to comprehend. But remembering that this is an evolutionary process. And so when people come and say we need a revolution, we really don't need a revolution because that means we just go back and change the names and the process of of the past continues. 
this is an evolution of consciousness in which uh, people are becoming group oriented, less narcissistic, less devoted to materialism. And those seem like simple things, but they're really uh, very extraordinary in terms of the changes that they are bringing to the world. So in religion, it's particularly stressful because many of us are relying on the old traditions for our comfort, for our habitual um, uh, aspiration. And I think of religion as a, as a ritualizing of human aspiration, a way for people to get in touch with their uh, spiritual side at whatever level we are, and we're all at different levels and uh, provide a common meeting place with for others to join together and uh, express their spiritual aspiration, the, the, the desire for betterment, however that's expressed. And so when people have begun to not go to churches, this is a crisis for the clergy and church government and, and uh, the business side of church uh, also. And so the people themselves are not rejecting Christianity, I don't think. What they are rejecting is the formula uh, of the rituals and the dogmas that have been the essence really of Christian churches as they have been preached down through the many hundreds of years already. So people are not re resonating with the old formulas of church, and they are looking for how to how to reformulate their aspirations, uh, find a footing, uh, and so they have very many questions about uh, who God is, who was Jesus, uh, uh, where are the disciples, what. What can we expect? How come all of this is happening? And I suggest that the ageless wisdom teachings, uh, which really comprise the philosophy and the science of human existence as it has under uh, underskirted all the religious traditions, and we can talk about that later, that that bedrock of understanding of spirituality can provide a path for people to move into a new way of thinking about God, uh, their, their feelings about uh, spirituality. Uh, and so this is what I hope that this talk can maybe provide a pathway. And I, I don't speak as a really tremendous expert, but I do uh, hope that people will research for themselves uh, the materials that I'm using, uh, most of which come from a website called shareinternational.us. Uh, uh, all of this background information is available there. So take what I say as you would, just consider it, and uh, do 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 a little research and see what you find. In my own family, we were raised Catholic, and my mom always went to church and took us with her. And later on, my dad did too. But my mother turned away briefly from the church herself. Uh, she had some misgivings about the church to begin with, but she was always faithful. So at that point, she stopped going briefly. Eventually, she went back, but that was very difficult for her. Well, that's that is similar to an experience I had. I uh, I had always uh, sat in back of of the church growing up in the Catholic Church, and and thinking to myself, what, what, you know, what, and uh, yet I kept on, and uh, I attended a Presbyterian college and. Uh, would go to confession and and a mass in the in the little town that was nearby, 
And uh, when the priest there found that I was attending the Presbyterian College, he threatened me with excommunication. And I, 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 I don't remember having any particular feeling other than, well, that's it. And so I continued on with the, my philosophical studies and got in, interested in uh, the Alice Bailey teachings of the Ageless Wisdom teachings, and then the work of Benjamin Krem, whose extraordinary information uh, uh, attracted me greatly. And I've researched that and, and known Mr. Krem for over 30 years personally in his book, The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, uh, was the, we call it the Little Red Book, was the first book I read, and it answered so many of the questions that I had while sitting in the back of the church saying, what? And so uh, I have found that it changed my life totally, and I uh, just hope to contribute a little bit to uh, maybe steering people to have a look at that information and see what happens in their spiritual lives. I find it the most extraordinary, uh, beneficial, hopeful, and stabilizing information that anyone could have, particularly at this time in human history. I thought I recalled you saying, too, that you had spoken to your husband about that experience as a young college goer. And he had said that men didn't seem to be under the same pressure back then, like there was a double standard. And yeah. so maybe you can talk a little bit more about your leaving and coming back and uh, relate the story of what it was like going to church um, more recently with your family. So take us from, from way back to college days to today, your experience of coming and going with the church. Well, as I say, after that um, eventful experience in the confessional, I simply lost uh, my, uh, I don't know whether it was through uh, fear that I had stayed in the church or what, I, I lost my mooring uh, in the Catholic church. But as a philosophy student, I was being exposed to a number of of uh, also religious and philosophical thinking. Uh, and after I married, uh, I said to my husband, I said, you know, who, and my husband was raised in the Catholic church and has a very liberal view of the whole thing, but uh, he is from Texas, I'm from New Jersey. And uh, we had an Irish Catholic priest who would stop mass if you were late uh, so my experience was a little more um, fundamental, I suppose, than his. But when I asked him, I said, well, you know, you went to a Presbyterian college. What about what what did your pastor say about that? And he said, oh, they never they never gave us any trouble. They were just people like us, you know. And I was astounded, and I he he did tell me he thought that because I was female, that it was a little bit um, skewed in the priest's favor as far as authority is concerned. Uh, so that uh, is part of my history there. But I must say that uh, with my children and grandchildren, who usually come at Christmas time and we go to mass at midnight. Uh, that I cannot go into a mass without my dark glasses. I go in there. The energy is so incredible that it makes me weep. And so most people are praying and I'm sitting there trying not to, to just bawl. Yes, Betsy. These powerful spiritual energies are now being felt by people of all spiritual persuasions. You mentioned the spiritual hierarchy earlier. Within the first of Benjamin Krem's books, The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, and his other 17 books, he explained that the spiritual hierarchy includes the most enlightened masters from all the religions, East and West. 
In truth, the original teachings of many religions are very similar. For example, they all include the Golden Rule. For the first 500 years of Christianity, reincarnation was a vital component of Christian doctrines. In A.D. 543, the then ruler of the Roman Empire, Emperor Justinian I, removed the teachings of reincarnation from the scriptures of Christian Orthodox doctrines. If reincarnation and karma had not been removed from the Bible and suppressed from Christian doctrine, these processes would be as familiar to Christians as they are in other religions. Each of us continues to reincarnate until we become fully enlightened. Maitreya was the first human on earth to keep reincarnating until he perfected himself as the Christ, the head of our planet's spiritual hierarchy. He is known by many names, such as the future Buddha, the Imam Mati, the Messiah, and the world teacher. Many Eastern scholars say Maitreya worked as Krishna, whom Hindus view as, quote, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, unquote. While many Christians expect Christ's return, many Hindus also expect the second coming, but of Krishna. After Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Alice A. Bailey, and Helena Rorick, Benjamin Krem is the fourth major writer since the late 1800s who received the ageless wisdom teaching from the masters. They know that the world teacher Maitreya, the Christ, worked through his disciple, Jesus. Thus, Jesus was known as Jesus the Christ for the three years of his teaching mission after the baptism. Since then, Jesus has reincarnated several times and, according to Benjamin Krem, is now living in Rome and is working closely with Maitreya the Christ, who is here for the first time as himself. So, Betsy, I'd like to read some of the words from Mr. Krem's book that you said helped you come to a different understanding of the Christ and of the Second Coming. Krem explains that when the Christ returns, he will not at first reveal his presence, nor will the masters who precede him, but gradually steps will be taken which will reveal to men that there lives among them now a man of outstanding, extraordinary potency, capacity for love and service, and with a breadth of view far beyond the ordinary. Men and women all over the world will find themselves drawn into the awareness of the point in the modern world wherein this man will live. And from that center of force will flow the true spirit of the Christ, which will gradually reveal to men that he is with us. The changes which will take place in the world will proceed with a speed unprecedented in the whole history of the planet." Unquote. In the 40 years since Benjamin Krem wrote this, those massive changes have been happening from the first Occupy movement to thousands of protests today, all calling for changes, which Krem goes on to write, quote, will be so radical, so fundamental, that the world will be entirely changed for the better." Unquote. This is a time for awakening. So, as we say in the title of this video, open your eyes. I did find that, uh, as Mr. Krem wrote from his master, that both Jesus and Maitreya do uh, energize the Eucharist at the communion in, in the Catholic tradition. And so at that part of the Mass, it just is overwhelming the, the beauty and the energy that fills the church. So I have, I have the deepest respect for 
uh, Catholicism for churches in particular, because I think many of us really do need a structural arrangement for our spiritual ambitions. And so I think, again, Christianity is certainly not dead. In fact, I think it's on the, the path of an incredible renewal and the energies inside a church, a Catholic church, is what I know. I'm sure it's true other in other churches. It is so overwhelming. I can't imagine that people can go away without having uh, said, I wonder what happened. I just felt so, uh, it was so beautiful. And I felt so in love with the world. I have a son who is... Um, also a, a Catholic. They were both raised Catholic. And he had an experience in his Catholic church uh, where he said, and he, he was, he had, he doesn't really have a lot of exoteric spirituality uh, because he's a physician. And so he's very scientific. But he said that he sat there one time in his church not too long ago and he was overwhelmed with this feeling of love in for everything he he could not explain what happened but he's never forgotten it and so uh again i think a church can be one of the best places for uh, most of us to experience the kind of love that god spreads abroad for his children and it, it sounds as if you had your own renewal, Betsy. You went from when you were younger thinking, what am I doing here, to weeping. Yes. And while you're at church there, you're probably keeping Jesus busy. He is sight unseen and visibly probably consoling you in the pew while the, rest, <laughs> while the rest of the mass continues. Guess what I want to express is the fact that it's going to be okay, that this is all, uh, I don't want to say under control, but it's part of a larger plan for humanity. And it's a step forward in our, uh, as I said before, in our spiritual evolution. And as if the churches will relax and maybe do some research uh, on the ageless wisdom teachings, maybe learn a little bit more about the spiritual hierarchy of this planet, which has been uh, overseeing human spiritual evolution since our beginning on this planet. Uh, it would broaden their understanding of what people are feeling, and they might be able to speak uh, more um, authoritative, not authoritatively, but more uh, get a more resonant response. Uh, the fact that Jesus, according to the Ageless Wisdom teachings and Benjamin Krem's most recent information from his own master, uh, Jesus ha is back. He has been since 1979 living in the outskirts of Rome, but travels the world as he has many, many times before. Uh, working with the Christian churches to shake loose the dogmas that have encrusted the churchianity of today. And that is the essence of what people need to happen. His, he's in charge of the Christian churches wherever they are found and is intending to bring the church back to its original purpose, which is to teach and to heal. And those are the very uh, qualities, I think, that many, many people are looking for, whether they see it in, a, in, in Protestant churches, Catholic churches. I don't think it matters all that much. Uh, but Jesus is on the case. And uh, as we see, as difficult as it seems, it's going to be okay, and it will be much better than ever. That's a wonderful message. And, you know, you'd think that the people that became unchurched, like you and I and many others, would be more open to all of this. 
Yes, uh, there is a uh, a Substack uh, and a Medium post um, facility online. And Dan Foster is, I think, uh, well, he is a, a I, I don't like the word fall it away, but he has what he calls the backyard church. And he uh, has distanced himself from a lot of the dogmas uh, in, in churchianity. And he provides a look from afar at the Christians uh, and their churches. And he has a wonderfully interesting uh, column that he writes practically every day. And when I read the com the comments uh, that people make on his columns, I see that there are many, many people who call themselves in the process of deconstructing from the dogmas of the church, which of course is what Dan Foster is, is leading uh, in that process. So as as I said before, people are people are not uh, leaving Christianity, but they do want another look at the essentials of Christianity to try to find some footing uh, which can carry them through uh, and uh, give them hope as far as their spiritual aspiration is concerned. So uh, that is. That is what is happening. Uh, Facebook, you know, it, people laugh at it and call it all kinds of names, but it still is quite the place where people come and they uh, they discuss and ask questions. Um, there's another group on Facebook called Esoteric Christianity, which, of course, uh, the Esoteric Christianity comes through uh, all the Bailey books and and Blavatsky and uh, Benjamin Krem's material. And uh, that has uh, had, I think, a very broad influence on people who follow that particular group uh, because they can ask questions. And then uh, those of us who uh, provide a perspective of the ageless wisdom teachings, which includes Bailey, Blavatsky, Krem, uh, Rorick, uh, uh, Sai Baba, for example, uh, can can maybe provide answers to their questions. And so the way we do it is, you know, it's kind of like if your child comes to you and asks a specific question. Uh, well, you don't have to go through the whole whys and wherefores of an answer for them. They really just want to know an answer to their question. So it seems a palatable way for people to ask a question and have some answers to consider. And I think everyone in this work understands, as we've said before, that all we are trying to do is point in a direction for people who are ready, willing, and, and want to do their research for them to find out for themselves because it's a personal experience. The the return that we've been discussing, the return of the church, I take it that you are positing that uh, it's beginning, it's already begun. And in what forms has it shown up in the media other than Facebook? Well, uh, when Benjamin Krem was alive and we were uh, promoting his talks all over the world and he would we would invite him, our little group, transmission group would invite him, for example, to Dallas. And uh, and we would alert the media. In the beginning, uh, back then, uh, there was, in the Dallas Morning News, there was a full page article uh, written by a freelance um, uh, author of Ben. He came to the house and he interviewed Ben and wrote a an article describing events of the talk. And uh, Benjamin Krem's talks were unique because at the beginning and at the end of every talk, he uh, would be overshadowed by the uh, the leader, the head of our spiritual hierarchy, whose personal name is Maitreya. 
And the process of overshadowing is very common in the esoteric world. Uh, the Buddha, for example, overshadowed the Prince Gotama, who became Gotama Buddha. Uh, Maitreya overshadowed Jesus in Nazareth uh, for the last three years of Jesus's life. And so uh, Maitreya embodies the Christ consciousness, the energy of love. And so in his overshadowing of his disciple, Jesus, Jesus became Jesus Christ. And so that uh, overshadowing would occur at the beginning and the end of each of Benjamin Krem's talk. Uh, that was probably a little much for some in the media. Uh, gradually, I think they uh, probably thought this would be a, an easy story to denounce and, and uh, get rid of. And so if Maitreya would just appear to them, uh, why they would get on with, they would report it and get on with other items. The fact that Maitreya has not appeared to the media that we are aware of, although he has been filmed uh, by CNN in an interview, we're told. Uh, he is, the media has been, uh, let's say they've embargoed this story. I know I personally uh, thought that our local PBS station here uh, might be interested in this story. And so, I uh, had one of my friends call and suggest that they interview me. And the man who was on the phone said, well, just a minute. And he came back a minute later and he said, no, we, we won't cover that story. So it's really been a story that hasn't been told yet. Uh, and yet we have uh, Maitreya's forecasts. We have Benjamin Krem's master's discussion of such things as, as the events of 9-11, the future of America. I mean, really tremendous quantities of valuable perspective and information. So now that there's such chaos in the political economic field, especially, we're hoping that the media might take another look at this story. And so we're very anxious to again, try to educate people as to what the story is, but also to have media uh, spread it around a little bit more. And to use an old cliche, it does sound in some ways like the greatest story ever told. So, <laughs> so true. So yeah. hopefully PBS will get around to interviewing you eventually. Ah, I don't know. <laughs> And I know you had also mentioned TV ads um, featuring uh, celebrities who were talking about um, religion and coming back to the church. Yes, uh, uh, Fox News, a man named Tucker Carlson, uh, interviewed John Voight, the, uh, the actor, if you remember, uh, uh, I think he's a little bit elderly, but not too bad, but uh, I was watching one day and uh, Tucker Carlson was talking to John Voigt and uh, John Voigt began to describe an experience that he had when he was at his lowest ebb. His marriage was a mess. His career was a mess. He really was, as he said, he was down in the basement. He really didn't know what to do when a voice came and talked to him and uh, he described it in great detail. It's up on YouTube. You can find it there. That's John Voigt and Tucker Carlson. And so it, there's an extensive discussion of his experience, but the nub of it was that this voice said to him, I am building a stairway to heaven step by step. And to this day, John Voigt is uh, is taken up speaking. Uh, I think he has a podcast and and whatnot. And so, to me, the experience was an experience of Maitreya. 
uh, although we don't have Benjamin Krem to authenticate it at all, it has all the earmarks because it changed his life. And that to me is the uh, validation when an experience changes you inwardly so vastly, you can be sure it comes from a good source. That's amazing too, because John uh, Boyd is known for his conservative views and having been born in, I believe it's 1938, mm -hmm. sounds like this information is helped keeping him young. So yeah, yeah. and the, the dogma in the church, the sort of the dogma church connection, that also seems to be falling away, even in the conservative churches. Yes, I think the, the very conservative churches um, are having the hardest time with this. And, uh, you know, their their audience or the, the people who are there are, uh, generally speaking, quite a bit older. And we all know what that means. If you don't have young people coming in, eventually there's no one there. And you can understand, especially with old people who are being old myself, who are a bit set in their ways, um, that that they they cannot comprehend a different way, and they may be afraid to even consider a different approach to God. Uh, in the in the discussions that I've seen about who is God and if God is so good, how come there's such bad goings on among his children? And so uh, when people personalize God or they personalize Satan, uh, uh, that's where the trouble seems to begin. And the ageless wisdom teachings uh, strongly suggest that God is a... Uh, the sum total of all the laws, the energies, and the forces in the solar system. That would be our the person or the the being, the the center which we call God. And when you understand the way the 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 plan works, so to speak, you understand according to the ageless wisdom teachings that. We do reincarnate. We are souls in incarnation. We are in a process of enlightenment through various and sundry uh, incarnation lifetimes, if you will. We've all had hundreds of thousands of lifetimes and that each time we come into incarnation, we hopefully make a little bit of progress into uh, expanding our awareness outside of ourselves and understanding the need for love and compassion uh, within our relationships. And those qualities, eventually, uh, we understand our soul qualities. They are the expression of the divinity, which is inside every single person as potential in some cases, as uh, mildly expressing in some cases. Then you have a Mother Teresa type, which is the soul expressing itself strongly. And then you have the world servers, the, the saviors who are full self-realized with a capital S, soul-realized, uh, personalities expressing divinity in its fullness and that we are all in the process heading down that road and so it gives a meaning to life that is so far beyond what many of us have tried to understand as what is the purpose of life so we have a lot of opportunity we we have to learn our lessons because of the notion of karma uh, and that everything that we think, everything that we do comes back to us, the results come back to us so that we can experience how it went and what happened when we had those thoughts and performed those actions. And interestingly enough, there is a, a theologian philosopher uh, from long, long ago named Oregon. 
he was the his philosophy was the philosophy of the early Christian church, uh, the early Christian uh, groups, if you will. And he taught reincarnation and he taught the law of cause and effect. So those notions are gradually filtering back into some Christian discussions. And what that does is it uh, creates an understanding of why we have such evil in the world. It's created by us that there is nobody pushing our uh, us toward evil it's it's us and so we can change and we can make our lives better ourselves we don't need an authority to try to force us through fear uh to change through punishment to change and having had children myself i can understand the younger generations of children do not respond to punishment as my generation, for example, did. Uh, and so we now have such elements as drug use, uh, wild rebellion, even suicide among the young because they have no uh, no hope they have no understanding of who they are or what the heck they're doing so an under a broader understanding of the purpose of life of who we are and what we're doing here really no matter what else is as as is said life is what happens to you when you're making other plans uh, i think generation z in particular is one of the least church generations that has come along and interestingly enough in february of this year there was an outbreak of what they call a revival at a small uh, university in kentucky and those students are gen z um, category and it was all in the papers. It was on major media for two weeks. It was an extraordinary story. What do you think about the idea of having more women in leadership positions in the church and how this may help it um, break out of these, both the scandals and out of the dogma that they've been mired in for so long? Yes, well, several things. Um, I think um, uh, a parallel advancement would be to have marriage among uh, the priesthood. I think that, and and families, I think that would enable them to uh, uh, have a deeper reverence for the priesthood. And I think that would... Uh, bring them closer in touch to their parishioners who probably most of them uh, have have children and the issues that children uh, bring up. So yes, very definitely. Now the uh, age of Aquarius, the age of, of Maitreya is the age of the woman. And it's so interesting to see how the notion of uh, feminism and uh, uh, what do women want? And, and I must say, I feel very sorry for the males um, in this. It's been brutal <laughs> for them. Uh, but, uh, but from the standpoint of the churches, the reason there have been male priests uh, has to do with the electromagnetic uh, positive and negative charge, for example. Women are the negative pole of electricity and men are the positive pole. And uh, as I read it, the, uh, the need to ground the positive spirituality on this planet through the churches has required a male priest uh, in order to, as I say, uh, take that spiritual energy and ground it because that's the positive pole. The women in the congregation are the negative. They are the recipients, if you will. 
of that energy and the women are the culture uh, creators they are the cultural no they provide the the um the boundaries if you will through which any creative adventure uh has to be contained in order to manifest in on the physical plane however in a couple hundred years according to benjamin krem uh there will be women priests and that will be as this notion of uh, balancing the male and the female uh, within ourselves uh, becomes more advanced and I think that will that should open a whole new door to a lot of things we can't even imagine I think at the moment but yes the time is coming this is the age the 2000 year age of Aquarius is the age of the woman and women right. will be will be balanced in in that uh, relationship with the male not dominating uh, but balanced in in equal measure so it should be a harmonious ending for this yes um i've heard the saying that that this is the age of the emergence of the full flowering the full force of the feminine aspect of god let's go back to that subject that you started talking about the spiritual revival at the um asbury college um earlier in um 2023 yeah it was in the beginning of february uh, uh that as i under there are many stories the one i remember hearing uh, right uh after or as this was occurring was that uh every friday the university has a chapel meeting and uh the coach the football coach was it was his turn to give the uh the program and uh he was as he was getting dressed for that morning uh program he was telling his wife he really you know he was at a loss as to what 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 could he say to these students uh as you know there has been tremendous uh shootings and killings in in churches and in schools in america over the last couple of years or even longer and so i suspect he was trying to think of some way to uh alleviate some of the stress of the of the students anyway he had no idea what he was going to talk about he said i'm you know i'm a coach I know football, but that's about it. Anyway, so he uh, he got up on the stage of the auditorium there at the university and talked, I think about, as I recall, uh, he talked about uh, needing uh, for us to love each other. And he talked about the need for group groups to come together and share their feelings about things. and and uh uh he talked for a while and then he was finished and uh he said thank you very much and walked off the stage and the the children who were there the students were there didn't leave they just sat there and an energy according to reports came over that building that room that was as one student explained it, it was as if they were transported to another country. They felt love, overwhelming love, compassion, understanding. And it was as if all the barriers that they had had uh, normally erected among each other were gone and they were, they started singing and the, <laughs> The experience went on for two weeks. Uh, they had between 50 and 75,000 people came to get into that room and experience this energy. Uh, the president of the uh, university said he was concerned that the students wouldn't keep up their homework or their work, 
but that wasn't the case. They kept up with their studies, but they spent all day and all night in that auditorium. So it was, uh, again, it was reported on major media. And uh, there's an article here I have from the Cincinnati Inquirer about it, which anyone can look up. Um, it was from uh, February, excuse me, February 27th, 2023, and it's by Hadassia Ogawadu, and it's a beautiful description, an interview with some of the people who were there. Uh, there was a one student whose name was Alexandra Petras. Uh, she was a senior and doing journalism there. She says, I've never witnessed anything like this before in my entire life. We can't end what we didn't start. The Holy Spirit started this and the Holy Spirit's going to continue to move throughout this campus and throughout other college campuses and throughout other churches. And sure enough, there were other universities and colleges that apparently subsequently felt the same experience. Uh, Lee University in Tennessee, Anderson University in Indiana, Ohio Christian, uh, Cedarville University, uh, and Northern Kentucky University. And apparently this has gone around as a, a viral sort of thing. And again, these are Gen Z for the most part. These are the generation who had come in not... Um, not being able to resonate with the old formulas of Christianity. And here they have this experience that apparently is, is just incredible. And do you suppose, too, this might be an example, Betsy, of the spiritual hierarchy of the planet's presence? That's what's so interesting, yes. Uh, you know, uh, the head of our spiritual hierarchy, as I've said, is is uh, is a great teacher, and he really wants to be known as simply a teacher. He's not forming a religion, but he is here to teach humanity uh, who we are and to take the kingdom of God out of the churchianity and to open it to everyone. Uh, based on these basic principles of the ageless wisdom teachings. So uh, in my own thinking, I would assume uh, he works very closely with the Master Jesus. I would assume that it was uh, probably both Maitreya and the Master Jesus who kept this energetic experience going. And Maitreya had said, he said, you know, I don't want you to believe in me. I want you to experience me. And if you think of the youngsters nowadays, I know many, many of them, they're not interested in buying a house. They're not interested in even having a car. They want to experience something. And so I think it's incredibly um, appropriate that this kind of experience uh, is being had by so many of that generation. It's quite fitting. I know you had said something about if you can maintain that state, yeah. then there's no fear or worry or judgment. Um, as you put it, what you think is what you are. Yes, and even scientifically, psychologically, and in, uh, in quantum physics, we're beginning to understand that reality is vibration, that there is nothing solid. There's nothing mechanical going on. It is all a response, a vibrational response to vibration. And so if you, if you think about uh, what you entertain in your life for the most part, if it is love, if it is openness, if it is understanding, uh, you meet people on a different level and they will respond to you at your level. 
Uh, it takes a little courage and practice at first. I like to do it at the grocery store when you, you know, you walk down the aisles and you see people and you catch their eye and just give them a big smile. Uh, sometimes they're surprised. Um, everyone responds with a smile. I haven't had, and I'm keeping track, I haven't had a negative response yet. <laughs> and, you, and you remind me too, the the um, atmosphere of not just that event at Asbury College, which spread across the country, but of also uh, this conversation. A quote from Maitreya, the world teacher we've been talking about, from one of Benjamin Krem's books called Maitreya's Teaching, The Laws of Life, where he said, in the light, there are no disagreements. In the dark, even two people will argue because we're not detached and we're blind. Mm -hmm. But this movement that you've described, I think is giving sight, not just to Christians, but to people of all faiths across the globe. And I think we are pretty much at this point out of time. And so if you'd like to give us the last few sentences, Betsy. At this time, when there seems to be such darkness in the world, such catastrophe, such division. I just suggest that we just raise our thoughts a little bit. Think about love. Think about God as love. Think about the fact that love literally makes this world go round. And hold your attention there uh, and just see what happens. Give it a try. Well, I think I'm going to take your advice, Betsy, and I think a lot of our audience might just entertain that idea in their own way as well. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you, Betsy, for being a guest on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe, hit the like button, and share this video with your friends. We appreciate your comments and we respond to them.